four, and it says serum levels, blood levels of T bars, predict cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. And the conclusions down there found that it was an independent marker. It was actually a better predictor of cardiovascular events. I've said before, that's not an event you want to attend. It's not an event like this one. A, a cardiovascular event may be an attack of angina, chest pains upon exertion. It may be a myocardial infarct that takes you to your knees. It may be fatal. So there are a number of kinds of cardiovascular events. The important thing is the higher the T-bars, the more likely a cardiovascular event was to occur. We've also talked in the past about how oxidative stress is hypothesized to give rise to atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, and plaque formation. Plaque is the, the goop that accumulates in an artery and eventually may clog it, so you get into trouble if that happens. Your heart muscle depends on oxygen. If it doesn't get enough oxygen, uh, that muscle has a hard time doing its job, namely pumping the blood. So this uh, figure, if you look at it from left to right, is kind of a timeline. So if you look at the, the beginning part of this art, this represents an artery in your heart. You see the first thing there is LDL. That's LDL cholesterol. That's a protein that binds cholesterol. We're all obsessed with what our LDL levels are. But LDL is perfectly normal. In fact, you die if you don't have any LDL. What's important is to keep it low. And why is that important? It's because if oxidative stress enters the picture, it leads, if you jump ahead a little bit, to oxidized LDL. And that's what many cardiologists believe is the real trigger to atherosclerosis. Also early on, you see those blue cells labeled monocytes. These are normal immune cells that can become inflammatory cells. And those monocytes recognize the oxidized LDL. So if free radicals are high, free radicals attack LDL, oxidize it. The monocytes eat that oxidized LDL. They actually fill up with little globules of it. And they become activated inflammatory cells and the histologists call them foam cells, which you see later in the sequence, because they look foamy. There are all these little bubbles of oxidized LDL inside the cells if you look under a microscope. And those foam cells deposit in the vessel wall, and you see there's now this thickening yellow, ugly uh, deposit. It contains foam cells, it contains oxidized LDL, and it slowly starts to occlude, to close in the lumen of the artery. The lumen is, is the part of a pipe that's open in the middle. That's where the water flows through. If the lumen closes down because there are deposits on the walls of a pipe, then that vessel becomes compromised. And the real problem, the, the event that may be fatal, is when this deposition of this ugly yellow plaque in the vessel wall, when it breaks through that layer of Teflon that keeps blood from clotting, it's called plaque rupture. So if that layer of cells is breached and plaque rupture occurs, you will get an instant thrombosis, a blood clot that forms right at that spot, and that big blood clot will completely occlude the artery, and it may be fatal. So that's the progression of atherosclerosis. And we've talked before about how oxidative stress is involved in the early part of that process. But it's, ox it's also involved in the later part of the process, and that's where this Ohio State study comes in. So let's assume, again going from left to right here, that oxidative stress leads to atherosclerosis. It's a slow process. 30 or 40 years developing. Uh, an alarming part of this is that atherosclerosis begins with something called fatty streaks in the wall of an artery. They're now being seen in children as young as 10 or 12 years old. 
so they can begin in the first decade of life. It's a process that builds and builds, and by the time a person reaches 40, 50, 60 years of age, there's almost certainly evidence of atherosclerosis, probably in everybody in this room. It's a time bomb. And help, <clears throat> uh, lifestyle can help prevent it. Good diet, exercise, all the things you hear about can help slow it down. And it doesn't have to be the thing that does you in in the end, but it's a process. It's like if you build a new house, 20 years later, the pipes will be rusty and there will be some corrosion and deposits. It might be still fully functional, but that, that happens. All right, so if atherosclerosis leads to partial or complete blockage of arteries, you go to a doctor either for a checkup or because you're having chest pains or for one reason or another, and if it's bad enough, there are three common surgical interventions that can occur. One is a coronary artery bypass, and again, I think you all have heard about people who have that. It's extraordinarily common surgery these days. Another procedure done by cardiologists without so much invasive surgery is angioplasty, and that's threading a balloon into that blocked artery, inflating the balloon. You can open it up. These days, initially, it was just the balloon, and it was found out, sure, you can stretch that artery open if it's clogged by plaque, but within a month or two, it starts to close down again, not surprisingly. Now, what's done is a stent is inserted, so I'll tell you about that and show you some pictures of a metal stent that, once the artery is opened up, can help keep it open. It also has uh, consequences and has medical problems produced by the surgery itself. And finally, carotid endarterectomy refers to the carotid arteries, big arteries in your neck that take the blood supply to your, bl to your brain. Very important arteries, obviously. They too get clogged with plaque. And so you may, have, you may know family members or relatives uh, or friends who've had carotid endarterectomy. What the surgeon does there is he literally temporarily bypasses the clogged part, opens it up, and just scrapes out the gunk, and I'll show you a, a disturbing picture of that <laughs> later on as well. All right, all three of these procedures have failure rates. They're not complete permanent solutions to the problem. And if you look at the 10-year failure rate, 10 years is a long time for a, a surgical procedure to improve your quality of life. But with coronary artery bypass surgery, after 10 years, up to 50% of the grafts have failed. They're either almost completely blocked again, or they have been completely blocked. And so often, coronary artery bypass surgery has to be repeated, or some other, one of these other procedures sometimes can help. With stents and angioplasty, they don't even last that long. Sometimes four or five years is about what you expect from a stent. And I'll show you the reason they fail. And the same with carotid endarterectomy, a, a little better result there, maybe 30% failure rate after, after 10 years. But what we want to look at is what causes that failure rate. And it's our old nemesis, oxidative stress, again. Oxidative stress leads to something that was in the title of that Ohio State paper, intimal hyperplasia. So I'll show you what that means. And that's really the culprit that causes those opened vessels or bypassed vessels to clog up again after some years. Intimal hyperplasia is the problem. And what causes the intimal hyperplasia, at least in the context of the Ohio State study, was shown to be oxidative stress, something protandum can help with. All right, what, is, what is, does, do those words mean, intimal hyperplasia? It's simply a thickening of the wall of the blood vessel. So you might wonder, why didn't I say that in the first place? If you look at, if you look at the cross section of a blood vessel, what you see is there are several layers. If you cut a, a copper pipe open, there's just one layer. It's copper, all right? That's the wall of that pipe. If you cut an artery open, you'll see there are three distinct layers. So the, the pink circle in the middle is the lumen. That's where the blood flows through the hole in the pipe. 
And the innermost layer is called intima, which means innermost, all right? Physicians have a way of making things uh, more complicated than they should be, maybe. The media is the next layer, that pink layer, and that means middle, or the one in the middle. And the outer layer is called adventitia. So there are three distinct layers. What happens when the intima uh, proliferates? If that middle layer, st those cells start to divide, what happens is the wall, that inner part of the, the lining gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And here you see it protruding into the lumen. If this happened all around, the lumen would get smaller and smaller and smaller. The media also gets thicker, and cells in the medium, largely smooth muscle cells, and some of those will migrate into the intima. So you get this thickening of the wall that can occlude a vessel. Intimal hyperplasia, this wall thickening, is an iatrogenic condition. What that means, you, you may go to your doctor for some procedure, you go back a month later for a follow-up, and he may say something like, well, you have an iatrogenic infection, and it's, you're probably thinking, oh no, an iatrogenic infection. <laughs> what that means is he caused it, okay? He, he, <laughs> and, and not, not intentionally, it may have just been accidental, but iatrogenic means physician-induced. And Dan Royal can probably tell you there are lots of those things that are physician-induced because a lot of the procedures have consequences. And intimal hyperplasia is one of those consequences. So it's not done on purpose, and it doesn't require a, a, a malpractice attorney or anything like that. But it is caused by the procedure. All right, here, here are actual arteries. The upper picture is a cross-section through a saphenous vein, this one is from a pig, and you see those, it looks very much like the, the little diagram I showed you. So there's a big opening in the middle, that's the lumen. There's a dark intimal layer, a lighter colored media layer, and an adventitia around it. So that's a healthy vein on top. No intimal hyperplasia, a thin lining. And that vein normally lives in an environment where the oxygen concentration, that's what PO2 means, is about 25 torr. That's how we measure oxygen. So the oxygen level here is 25. That vein deals with taking used blood back to the heart. That's why it's got low oxygen content. But the vein is built to live in that environment. The vein at the bottom is same vein, saphenous vein from the same animal. And this section of the vein was cultured at high oxygen, 125, so it's five times higher. And that's close, that's a little higher than artery C, but it's close. Arteries normally see 100 torr concentration of oxygen. So that's the difference between veins and arteries. Veins carry low oxygen blood, arteries carry high oxygen blood. And oxygen, believe it or not, is toxic. You may think oxygen is good for you, and it is good for you, you die if you don't have oxygen. But you might be surprised if we took a, a healthy young adult rat who's breathing here at sea level, an atmosphere that's 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen. If we put that rat in a plastic box and we gave him 100% oxygen, which is only five times more than normal, in 72 hours that healthy animal would be dead because oxygen is that toxic. Five times more would destroy his lungs and the animal would die. So when a heart surgeon, and I'm gonna show you pictures of how this happens, takes a piece of a vein from your leg and uses it as new plumbing to go around an artery in your heart, he's asking a vein to do an artery's job and it's gonna see much higher oxygen than it's used to seeing and it does a good job, but it pays a price and it suffers. Why is artery bypass surgery done? If this represents, here in a very simple picture, an artery in your heart, and you develop plaque over the course of 10 or 20 or 40 years, again, you see the lumen of the artery is closing up, and the artery, by the way, is at 100 torr, it's high oxygen. So the 
the surgeon will take a piece of vein from your leg and just like a plumber might put in a new pipe around a clogged, if, a, if, if a, you have a drain pipe and a tree has grown through it with roots, you'll put in a new piece of pipe to bypass the problem, the obstruction. And that's what this vein is used for. So on the surface of your heart, you have a bypass around it. Now, the problem is that vein, which should be seeing oxygen at a level of 25, is now seeing oxygen at a level of 100 causes oxidative stress uniquely to this vein, and the result is the walls of the vein thicken and will eventually obstruct the lumen to the point where it may close up and clog. This is a picture of a heart that's just undergone triple bypass. You hear double, triple, quadruple bypass. That means how many clogged arteries had to be bypassed. All right, And the most important one is usually that one labeled LAD, the left anterior descending coronary artery, because that takes blood to the, really the part of your heart that does the heavy lifting, that left ventricle, so it's got, got to supply that part that contracts to pump the blood through your body. In the last decade or two, surgeons have avoided the use of veins as much as possible, and so what you see going to that LAD is an arterial graft. So that artery has come from your chest wall. It's been dissected out by the surgeons. And the reason he's using that, that's an uh, interior thoracic artery. It's a little redundant, so your chest wall gets by without it. 